Hello, my name is Reverend Dwayne Geary. I'm the president of the Glencoe Clergy Association. And we welcome you to our event, a community conversation with Richard Rothstein and his book, The Color of Law, a forgotten history of how our government segregated America. Since our rally in June, 2020, our initiatives were to engage in meaningful discussions of historical and current policies, practices, and procedures that foster racism. We continue to bring awareness and have different, difficult conversations uh, to help us to become a beloved community. We, the Glencoe Clergy Association, want to welcome and thank you for being here on tonight. In addition to our houses of faith in Glencoe, there are 25 additional houses of faith represented in attendance, including Jews, Christians, Baha'i Baha communities. The houses of faith are not only in Glencoe, Illinois, but also from states from Arizona, Kentucky, Georgia, Massachusetts, Missouri, and Alaska. We say thank you to each and every one of you for partnering with us on tonight. This event could not be successful without you. There are approximately 300 individuals who registered for this event on tonight. And we say thank you. As we prepare for our event with our special guest on tonight, we have to say thank you to Rabbi Wendy and her staff at the North Shore Congregational Israel. It's through Wendy's suggestion of the book and them securing our guests on tonight and setting up this platform that we are thankful to have. So Wendy and North Shore Congregation, we say thank you for tonight's event. Now, Wendy, would you please introduce our special guest? Thank you. It's my pleasure to be able to introduce Richard Rothstein. Uh, for many of you, actually the first hundred people who signed up for uh, this event uh, received a copy of The Color of Law. And, and our hope is that you have had the opportunity to read it uh, in advance. If you have read it in advance, you know how powerful uh, and more importantly, I think how important this book uh, and Richard's work really is now more than ever. As we sit at this pivotal moment in the life of our country, as we sit together this night, the conclusion of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day, uh, we who sit here together connected through the powers of the internet have the opportunity uh, to channel our energies, our curiosities, uh, our desires to uh, repair uh, and, and bring, bring more equality, bring more wholeness uh, to our country and to our communities, uh, have the opportunity to learn uh, with, with an expert uh, when it comes to matters in particular, in particular of housing and segregation in America. We learned from his book that while many people might understand this form of segregation in our country as de facto, uh, in fact, these, these steps, these movements that still affect us today uh, and affect our communities today were not just happenstance, uh, they were integrated intentionally uh, into our government in large and small insidious ways. We feel honored to learn with you tonight, Richard, and uh, it's my pleasure to turn it over to you now. Well, thank you very much, Rabbi, Rabbi Geffen, and thanks to all of you for engaging with me in this conversation uh, this evening. Uh, as you all know, in the 20th century, we had a civil rights movement in this country. It began by challenging the segregation of law schools in the 1930s, and then went on to challenge segregation in colleges and universities. And then in 1954, got the Supreme Court to prohibit legal segregation in elementary and secondary schools. And that 1954 Brown versus Board of Education decision 
gave impetus, inspiration to a movement of civil rights activists. They engaged in uh, marches and demonstrations, civil disobedience. Some people lost their lives in that struggle. Uh, others were seriously injured. We spent uh, some time this past summer memorializing uh, the late John Lewis, who uh, was severely beaten simply by trying for trying to get the right to vote for African Americans. For the next 15 years or so, that civil rights movement uh, after 1954 persuaded much of the country, not everyone, but much of the country that racial segregation was wrong, immoral, harmful to both blacks and to whites, incompatible with our self-conception as a constitutional democracy. It succeeded in abolishing segregation in uh, lunch counters in uh, buses, public accommodations of all kinds, interstate transportation, employment. And in 1968, we uh, succeeded in the wake of uh, the assassination of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, in passing a uh, Fair Housing Act that prohibited ongoing uh, segregation, ongoing discrimination in the sale and rental of housing. And yet then the civil rights movement pretty much ended, left untouched the biggest segregation of all, which is that every metropolitan area in this country, Chicago, but everywhere else is residentially segregated. I've lived in many of them, Chicago included. Every one that I've ever lived in had clearly defined areas that were either all white or mostly white clearly defined areas that were either all black or mostly black. How could it be if we came to an understanding that racial segregation was wrong, immoral, harmful to both blacks and whites, incompatible with our self-conception as a constitutional democracy? How could it be that we left untouched the biggest segregation of all? Well, I think partly um, it's because ending segregation in neighborhoods is a lot harder than ending segregation in restaurants. If we pass an ordinance saying you can't segregate restaurants anymore, the next day you can go to any restaurant, sit anywhere you want, regardless of your race. But if you pass an ordinance prohibiting segregation of neighborhoods, the next day things wouldn't look much different. So what we've done, all of us, and I mean all of us, blacks and whites, liberals, conservatives, northerners, southerners, Democrats, Republicans, all of us adopted a national rationalization, an excuse we give ourselves for not doing anything about this biggest segregation of all. And the excuse goes something like this. We tell ourselves that the forms of segregation that we abolished in the 20th century, whether it was colleges and universities or schools or restaurants or buses or trains, that was all done by government. If the federal government was requiring segregation, it was a violation of the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution, civil rights violation. And we all understand that if you have a civil rights violation, we have to end it. We have to do something to fix it. If state and local governments were doing it, it was a violation of the 14th Amendment. That too was a civil rights violation, something that imposed on us an obligation as American citizens to redress it. But residential segregation, we tell ourselves, that's something entirely different. That wasn't done by government. It wasn't done by law, by ordinance, by regulation, by public policy. Residential segregation, we tell ourselves, oh, that just happened naturally. It happened by accident. It happened because, oh, maybe a bigoted white homeowners or landlords wouldn't sell or rent to African-Americans in predominantly white communities. And, or maybe private businesses, banks, realtors, insurance companies, uh, developers uh, discriminated in how they carry out their purely private sector activities. Or maybe we tell ourselves that it's all because blacks and whites, we just like to live with each other of the same race. Uh, we feel more comfortable that way and that's why we're segregated. Or maybe we tell ourselves it's all because of income differences uh, on average African-American families have uh, less income than whites families, and not all of them, but on average. And so that many African-American families just can't afford to move to uh, high opportunity communities. Uh, all of these uh, individual, uh, private, bigoted, but uh, non-governmental 
activities is what created residential segregation. And we tell ourselves government had nothing to do with it. What happened by accident can only unhappen by accident. What happened naturally can only unhappen naturally. We give a name to this excuse, this rationalization. We tell ourselves that what we've got is de facto segregation. And the Supreme Court has said, if you have de facto segregation, something that government didn't create, government is powerless to do anything about it. In fact, it's unconstitutional to do anything about it if it wasn't created by government in the first place. Well, I spent um, much of um, my uh, recent career before I started working on this book that I'm talking about this evening, The Color of Law, writing about education policy, not about housing. And uh, I came to understand that the, the education policy that we're following in this country uh, in the 1990s and uh, 2000s uh, was nonsensical. Uh, we had a theory, and this was across the political spectrum. We had a theory that there was an achievement gap between black and white children. On average, African-American children performed less well in school than white children. And the reason we had this gap was uh, because teachers had low expectations of black children. Uh, they didn't try very hard to teach them. And if only we could get uh, teachers to try harder to teach black children, the achievement gap would disappear. That was our theory. Uh, we um, passed a law encapsulating that theory. It was called the No Child Left Behind Law. We required that the schools should test children every year and uh, hold teachers and schools accountable for the test scores. And we said, if those um, test scores didn't rise, we would uh, take punitive action against those teachers and schools and force the test scores to rise. And if we did this, the uh, law predicted that in just seven years, the achievement gap would disappear. Well, of course, it did nothing of the sort. The achievement gap didn't disappear, didn't even narrow to any uh, meaningful extent. Uh, we still got it. Uh, it's true, some teachers have low expectations of black children, but that's not the reason we have an achievement gap. Uh, the reason we have an achievement gap between black and white children is because so many African-American children come to school with social and economic uh, handicaps that prevent them from being able to take advantage of what the best schools and the highest expectations um, have to demand of them. And I remember writing one column uh, when I was doing this kind of work uh, about asthma. Uh, well, uh, as you may know, in a city like Chicago or elsewhere in the country in urban areas where there are low income uh, African-American children, they have asthma typically at four times the rate of white middle-class children in a place like Glencoe, uh, four times the rate. Uh, it's an enormous difference and African-American children have asthma at such a high rate because they live in neighborhoods that are more polluted more diesel trucks driving through, uh, more dilapidated buildings, uh, more vermin in the environment. And if a child has asthma, that child is more likely than a child who doesn't have asthma to uh, be up at night wheezing, uh, come to school drowsy the next day, sleepless. And if you have two groups of children that are identical in every respect, same racial composition, same social and economic background, uh, same family structure, uh, the group that is coming to school drowsier is going to have lower average achievement than the school that, that than the group that's coming to school well rested, not by a big amount, by a small amount. But then you begin to think of all the other conditions that children uh, from uh, uh, disadvantaged backgrounds come to school with, whether it's asthma or lead poisoning, which has a meaningful uh, impact on IQ, or homelessness, or economic insecurity. Each one of these has a similar impact on uh, achievement. And you add them all up and you pretty much explain the achievement gap. And then I began to realize as I was doing this research and, and writing that it's one thing if a child has asthma or lead poisoning or homelessness or economic insecurity, but what happens if every child in a school has one or more of these conditions? How can such a school ever be expected to generate the same kind of average achievement that a school uh, like those in Glencoe, uh, achieve with children who come to school well-rested, in good health, well-nourished, in economically secure homes. Uh, no matter how many laws you pass uh, to saying they'll do so, uh, it won't happen.
Well, we call schools where we concentrate children like that with these kinds of disadvantages, we call them segregated schools. Schools are more segregated today than they have been at any time in the last 45 years in this country. And the reason they're more segregated is because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. So I began as an education policy writer to think that maybe residential segregation was a school problem. That's how I began this work. I wasn't thinking about, <clears throat> thinking about housing. And then in 2007, I read a Supreme Court decision that evaluated uh, programs of two school districts, uh, Seattle, Washington, and Louisville, Kentucky. Both of them had a very trivial school desegregation plan. Uh, they both uh, uh, permitted parents to choose which school in the district their child would attend. But if the choice was going to further intensify segregation, that choice wouldn't be honored in favor of the choice of a parent whose child wouldn't do so. So if you had an all white and mostly white school and there was one place left and both a black and a white child applied for the last, last place, the black child would be given, some, be given some preference. And the Supreme Court evaluated this really trivial program and uh, denounced it, said you couldn't do such a thing. It said uh, the, the opinion was written by Chief Justice John Roberts. He explained that it's true the schools in Louisville and Seattle are segregated. He said they're segregated because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. That's a um, pretty wise observation was on the part of the Chief Justice's part. Uh, in fact, that is why schools in Louisville and Seattle are segregated. And then he went on to say that the schools in those uh, uh, cities are segregated, their neighborhoods are segregated, de facto was the term he used because of uh, the reasons I described before, uh, private bigotry, uh, private businesses discriminating, people wanting to live with each other of the same race, uh, economic differences. And he said, we have de facto segregation, something that was not created by government. Government is prohibited under the constitution from doing anything to fix it. Well, I read this decision and uh, as I mentioned, it involved two school districts. One of them was Louisville, Kentucky. And I remembered reading about something that happened in Louisville, Kentucky some years earlier. A white homeowner in a single family home in the suburb of Louisville called Shively. Uh, the suburb was all white, all white single family homes. This homeowner had an African-American friend who was living in the downtown area of, of Louisville, uh, renting an apartment, had a wife and a child. The African-American friend was a decorated Navy veteran had a decent job, wanted to move to a single family home, but nobody would sell him one. So the white homeowner in this suburb of Shively bought a second home uh, in his suburb and resold it to his African-American friend. And when the African-American family moved in, an angry mob of white neighbors surrounded the home, protected by the police. They threw rocks through the windows. They dynamited and firebombed the home. Police made no effort to stop this. But when the riot was all over, the state of Kentucky arrested, tried, convicted, and jailed with a 15-year sentence, the white homeowner for sedition, for having sold a home in a white neighborhood to a black family. And I said to myself, this doesn't sound to me much like de facto segregation. If the police, the courts, the entire criminal justice system was mobilized in order to maintain the racial boundaries of Louisville. And I looked into it further and I found that I'm not exaggerating here. There were hundreds and hundreds of cases of police protected, sometimes even police organized and led mob violence to drive African-Americans out of homes that they had legitimately purchased or rented in previously all white neighborhoods. These kinds of incidents of police protected violence took place in Chicago, in Detroit, in New York, and. Baltimore and Los Angeles and San Francisco and uh, everywhere in the country, there are examples of these kinds of, of events. And then I began to look into it further. And I discovered that it wasn't just 14th Amendment violations of police violence, police led violence or protected violence uh, that uh, created segregation, but there were many, many federal, state and local policies racially explicit designed to ensure that African-Americans and whites could not live near one another in any metropolitan area of this country. Um, I began to do this research. I began to document these uh, various policies, and that's what led 
uh, to the book, The Color of Law. I subtitled it, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America, because the policies I'm going to describe to you in a few minutes, uh, in a few minutes I have this evening, uh, were not unknown. They were widely known in the mid 20th century. We've forgotten about them. We've uh, repressed them. And we have adopted this uh, myth of de facto segregation. Uh, perhaps the most powerful policy the federal government imposed to create segregation in this country was a policy of the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration in the immediate post-war period to create suburbs in every metropolitan area of this country. Uh, we were not a suburban country at that time. Uh, as returning war veterans were coming back from World War II and needing housing, uh, suburbs was not a place that they were typically thinking of living. Uh, the only people living in suburbs at that time uh, were affluent people uh, because uh, we were a manufacturing economy. Uh, factories needed to be located in a central district downtown near a deep water port, a railroad terminal to get their parts, ship their final products. And so we had broadly integrated neighborhoods in many downtown uh, uh, areas of this country. Uh, we'd be stunned if we were transported back to that period of history to see the extent of integration that there was uh, simply because workers had to live close enough to a central uh, workplace district and walk to work. They didn't have automobiles to drive. As war veterans were returning from World War II, the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration began a program to move white workers, white working class families, middle class families out of urban areas into single family homes in suburbs like that one I described before in, uh, outside Louisville. Uh, it was a program that was for whites only. African Americans were prohibited from participating in this program. Uh, and you're familiar with the suburbs that were created uh, in this period. We were not a suburban country at that time, but now every metropolitan area, Chicago and every other one, is uh, uh, surrounded by a white noose of uh, all white, mostly white suburbs created in large part by the federal government in the mid 20th century. Uh, the most famous of these uh, is probably the one east of New York City, Levittown. Uh, you've probably heard of it, 17,000 homes uh, east of New York City in one, in one community. Uh, giants, giant uh, development, but they exist all over the country and Chicago as well. Uh, uh, the, the builder of that one, Levitt, uh, William Levitt, could never have assembled the capital to build 17,000 homes in one place. No bank would be crazy enough to lend him that kind of money uh, to buy the land and build the homes. The banks thought it was a crazy idea. As I said, we weren't a suburban country. They didn't think, any, think anybody would want to buy those homes uh, so far from downtown uh, Manhattan. Uh, the, um, the only way that Levitt could build Levittown was by going to the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration, requesting a, bank gar a federal guarantee of his bank loans to buy the land and build the, the project. In order to get that guarantee, he had to detail the materials he was going to use in construction, the architectural design, the layout of the streets, every detail, and make a commitment to the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration that he would never sell a home to an African-American. The FHA and VA even required Levitt and many of these builders to place a clause in the deed of every home, prohibiting resale to African-Americans or rental to African-Americans. And if any of you uh, live in a home that was uh, built uh, in about 1950 or, or around then, uh, earlier, you probably still have in the deed of your home, a clause that says it's for Caucasians only, no longer enforceable, but it's still there in the deed. You can't uh, change a deed once um, uh, something is written into it. Uh, and on that basis, with that commitment, Levitt was able to get a federal bank guarantee for his loans to build that subdivision. Uh, the homes were inexpensive, uh, 750 square feet typically. Uh, and uh, they sold at the time for Oh, maybe eight, nine thousand dollars in today's money. That's about a hundred thousand dollars. This requirement of segregation uh, by the FHA and VA uh, was not the action of rogue bureaucrats working in these federal agencies. This was an explicit, written federal policy. Uh, the FHA had a manual called the Underwriting Manual that was distributed to appraisers all over the country, whose job it was 
to evaluate the application of developers for federal bank guarantees for loans to uh, build uh, uh, their subdivisions. Uh, the underwriting manual of the FHA of the federal government said you could not recommend for a federal bank guarantee a, a project that was going to be uh, non-segregated. The uh, manual went so far as to say you couldn't even recommend for a federal bank guarantee a project that would be um, for whites only if it was gonna be located near where African-Americans were living. Because in the words of the manual, that would run the risk of infiltration by inharmonious racial groups. That's what the federal policy manual said. That's how this country was suburbanized on a whites only basis. This notion of de facto segregation is other nonsense. Uh, there's no basis in reality to it whatsoever. Uh, those homes, as I said, they were inexpensive, $100,000 homes. White families uh, were subsidized to move to them out of urban areas. If they were returning war veterans, no down payment was required. Any working class family can afford a home uh, for $100,000 uh, uh, with a, a mortgage from the FHA or VA, a 20 or 30 year mortgage. Only white families were permitted to do this. Well, as you know, in uh, the Chicago area, in New York and San Francisco and every community in the country, those homes, those $100,000 homes no longer sell for $100,000. Uh, you can't buy one for $100,000 anymore. They sell for 200, 300, 400, $500,000. Uh, in some cases, a uh, million dollars or more. Uh, the white families who were subsidized by the federal government to uh, buy those homes uh, gained over the next couple of generations equity as the homes appreciated in value, wealth. Uh, they used that equity, that wealth, to send their children to college. They used it to perhaps uh, take care of temporary emergencies, maybe medical, maybe temporary unemployment. They used it uh, to subsidize their own retirements. And they used it to bequeath wealth to their children and grandchildren who then had down payments for their own homes. African-Americans were prohibited from participating in this wealth generating program. The result is, and this is just one policy that the federal government uh, followed to impose segregation. The result of this particular policy is that today on average, African-American incomes are about 60% of white incomes, family incomes. There's a disparity there. It's a pretty big disparity, but still it's a 60% ratio. You'd think that if uh, the income ratio of, of white, of black family incomes to white family incomes was about 60%, you'd think that the wealth ratio would also be about 60%. People can save the same amount of money from the same uh, incomes. But in reality, while African-American families today have incomes on average about 60% of white incomes, African-American wealth is only 5% of white wealth. And that enormous disparity between a 60% income ratio and a 5% wealth ratio is entirely attributable to unconstitutional federal housing policy that was practiced in the mid 20th century. Unconstitutional, a civil rights violation. Every one of us as Americans has an obligation as American citizens to redress this, to redress civil rights violations. Well, that wealth gap is one of the major determinants of racial inequality in this country today. It locks African-Americans into uh, lesser resource neighborhoods than whites live in. Uh, it, uh, as I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, it uh, is a determinant of the achievement gap between African-American children and white children. It's a contributor to health disparities between blacks and whites. African-Americans, as you know, have shorter life expectancies on average, greater rates of cardiovascular disease, because they live, uh, not all of them, but too many of them live in less healthy, uh, more polluted neighborhoods, less access to fresh food. The uh, segregation that this wealth gap is a major contributor to is also responsible for the mass incarceration of young black men, of the police abuse that we spent so much time uh, focused on in the Black Lives Matter demonstrations after the murder of uh, George Floyd in Minneapolis this past a year, uh, last year. Uh, I'm not suggesting that the police would uh, never abuse African-American men if uh, it weren't for the segregation that we've created, but it's much, much more intense because we concentrate 
the most disadvantaged young men in single neighborhoods where they have no access to good jobs, no access to the transportation to get to those jobs, no access to the schools that can prepare them for those jobs. Uh, when we concentrate those young men in, in uh, neighbor, single neighborhoods of disadvantage, the police assume the, the stance of an occupying force, much as colonial forces uh, uh, assume that stance in, in uh, developing countries, in India and in the Congo, um, to maintain the uh, low income uh, native populations in those cases. Uh, it's the same uh, phenomenon. And uh, the uh, uh, segregation that is largely uh, uh, perpetuated by this wealth gap is responsible for something else that uh, I find, and I think probably you do as well, very, very dangerous and frightening, and we're very much aware of it uh, today, and that is the uh, vast political polarization that exists in this country to an extent that uh, never before has been known, uh, uh, at least uh, not the, in, in the last 100 years or 150 years. Uh, it largely tracks racial lines. The polarization is not entirely racial, but it largely tracks racial lines. Uh, how can we ever uh, develop, uh, create, and preserve the common national identity that we need to sustain a democratic society if so many African Americans and whites live so far from each other that we have no ability to identify with each other, no ability to understand each other's life experiences. So those are the ongoing consequences of the um, inequality, uh, the segregation that we as a country, uh, our government imposed. Uh, let me briefly uh, describe one other policy. There are many, many others uh, that uh, I document in the book. I'll describe one other. We all think uh, we don't know about public housing. Uh, public housing is uh, widely misunderstood though. We think of it as a place where poor people live. That's not how public housing began in this country. Uh, the first public housing in this country uh, was created in the depression during the Franklin Roosevelt administration, during the New Deal. Uh, it was um, for working families, people who had stable incomes who could pay the full cost in their, of, of the rent and not for poor people. Uh, its purpose was to provide housing for people who could afford housing, uh, but for whom no housing was being built during the depression. The Public Works Administration of the New Deal built the first public housing in this country and everywhere it built it, it segregated it frequently segregating uh, those communities that I described before that might've been integrated. Uh, and this went on everywhere in the country. Uh, the um, uh, Public Works Administration uh, built a project in Cleveland, uh, two projects in Cleveland, one black, one white, uh, in an integrated neighborhood that had pre has previously been integrated. The great African-American poet, novelist, playwright, Langston Hughes uh, described how he grew up in that neighborhood. He said his best friend in high school was Polish. He dated a Jewish girl in high school. It was an integrated high school in an integrated neighborhood, but the federal government segregated it with its public housing projects, one black, one white. Uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, someplace you've probably heard of, uh, a place that likes to think of itself as uh, better than everybody else, uh, smug, self-satisfied. Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, uh, the area between Harvard and MIT in the 1930s was an integrated neighborhood called the Central Square neighborhood. The Public Works Administration went into that neighborhood, demolished some housing, and the federal government built two separate projects in that community, one black, one white, creating a pattern of segregation in Cambridge and the greater Boston area with other projects uh, likewise uh, that uh, we know today as the ongoing result of those policies of segregation. Um, uh, during World War II, hundreds of thousands of workers uh, flocked to centers of war production to take jobs in uh, war industries uh, that hadn't existed during the Depression. They overwhelmed the communities where these uh, war industries were uh, located. If the government wanted the ships and the tanks and the airplanes uh, to be produced, it had to find housing uh, for these workers. And it did everywhere, everywhere that there was a war plant uh, during World War II where there were migrant black and white workers coming to take jobs in those war plants. The government created segregated housing for workers working in the same war plants, uh, creating frequently segregation where it had never before been known, even in an informal basis. Uh, the West Coast is a good example of that. There were very few African-Americans living on the West Coast uh, prior to World War II. Uh, 
uh, they came to take jobs in uh, mainly the shipbuilding and, and aircraft uh, factories on the West Coast. Uh, the government built segregated housing for these workers. Uh, in San Francisco, for example, there were five projects for war workers, mostly shipyard workers. Four were for whites only, one for African Americans, uh, creating segregation in San Francisco where it hadn't previously existed. And the same thing was done in Los Angeles and in Portland and Seattle up and down the West Coast, creating segregation on that part of the country that hadn't previously been known. Well, the policies to redress segregation to, to fix these civil rights violations are well known. Uh, policy experts, uh, 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 think tanks, uh, journalists uh, spin out policy ideas all the time. There's no mystery about what we should do about it. We should, for example, have an affirmative action program in housing that subsidizes African-Americans to move to communities that are now unaffordable to them, but that would have been affordable to them at the time that they were created for whites only. That would be a narrowly targeted remedy for a very specific constitutional violation. Uh, we don't do it, uh, not because we don't know what to do. We don't do it because there's no political support for that at this point. We have a number of policies that reinforce segregation. Uh, we have uh, some programs at the federal level that uh, subsidize the housing of low-income families who are disproportionately African-American and Hispanic today in, in many parts of the country. Uh, those programs reinforce segregation because they place that low-income housing disproportionately in low-income neighborhoods, already segregated neighborhoods, reinforcing their segregation. Uh, that's crazy. It's not that we shouldn't build better housing for in, in low-income neighborhoods. We should, but we should also be placing low-income housing projects uh, in, in uh, units in, in um, high opportunity communities where families have uh, better access to jobs and transportation and uh, schools with high achievement and grocery stores that sell fresh food and clean air. Uh, those are the kinds of policies we should be following. We should be abolishing zoning ordinances in um, exclusive white neighborhoods uh, like those uh, that some of you may be living in that prohibit the construction of even townhouses or garden apartments or uh, multi-unit uh, uh, buildings uh, uh, that have, house uh, working class families in communities that now prohibit anything but single family homes on large lot sizes that reinforce segregation. Well, as I say, the policies are well known. What's missing is not policy ideas. What's missing is a new civil rights movement like the one we had in the 1960s that will make it uncomfortable for this country to maintain the policies of segregation, the practices of segregation that we've inherited from conscious uh, policies of segregation uh, in the in the mid um, 20th century. I am now uh, working with a group of national civil rights leaders to create something we call a new movement to redress racial segregation. Its role will be to support uh, local committees of uh, uh, black and white biracial committees to redress segregation in their own communities, uh, to uh, create the, the momentum to uh, raise this issue uh, raise the awareness of this issue and begin to take steps uh, to um, implement uh, policies of desegregation of a variety of kinds in local communities all over the country. Uh, we were about to actually launch this uh, new movement uh, about a year ago and begin to support local committees that organized to do this. Uh, the social distancing of the pandemic made us put it off, but we're about to relaunch it again. And if um, any of you uh, are interested in uh, receiving a, an announcement of the uh, launch of this committee, uh, I'm sure that um, uh, if you signed up for this uh, webinar, um, we can find a way of getting you the information of how to, to sign up. So with that, I, I want to thank you uh, for your attention. I understand that, that we're going to have a discussion now with questions and answers, and I, I welcome the opportunity to discuss these issues with you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your unbelievable, unbelievable presentation uh, that I think in, in many ways, it, at least for me listening to you, um, you know, you hear so much of, I think one of the, the factors that makes your book so compelling, which is just your in, incredible 
sourcing of example after example after example. Um, and certainly large examples, but also in the small, real, local life that is the life that most, most of us regular folk know um, and, and can relate to. And um, for those who are watching, I do hope that um, if you have not yet read the book, uh, the color of law that you will, and in particular, you will look to the back to the notes section, um, which is, you know, it's not many a book that one would recommend actually looking to the notes section, but you know, it's 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 truly it's unbelievable um, the the amount of research and um, support documentation uh, that you offer to us, Richard, and I think that empowers us as people interested in doing this work uh, to speak to speak in fact in reality about what we're talking about and why it matters so thank you um, for folks who are watching um, we do have a few questions that were submitted in advance and if we have time we have about 18 minutes for questions so if we have time i know there are a couple questions that have popped up in the q a um, and you're welcome to submit questions there i'll just also say briefly uh, that if you are interested in learning um, more about this national effort, um, perhaps Richard, you can send me the information and I can send it out to everyone who signed up in advance. Um, and so we can get that out to you. Many of you um, are already asking about that in the chat. So we can do it that way. And if there's confusion, you can just email back to uh, the, the email that you, sent you the Zoom link if you're watching and, and we can coordinate that way as well. Well, I will get that all out to you. Fantastic. Me, if I may say something, Rabbi Geffen, you know, I, I don't think I've ever before uh, heard somebody recommend that people read the notes, but, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm not a professional historian, um, and I uh, wanted to document this so thoroughly uh, that uh, nobody could claim that um, it didn't really happen. And uh, in the four years that the book has come out, I think the thing I'm most proud of is that no professional historian has challenged a single fact that I recounted in this book. So this is a forgotten history. It's not a hidden history. There's nothing uh, mysterious about it. Uh, the American people, let me just say, when, when people moved into um, housing projects that were designated by race, they knew what was going on. It's not like it was a mystery. When people bought homes that uh, where the deed said they could never resell to an African-American, uh, with an FHA mortgage, they knew what was happening. So this was not a, a hidden history. It's, it's, it's something that we've all forgotten and that we uh, need to now remember because it, so long as we think it didn't happen, we, we have no uh, ability to remedy it. Once we understand that this is an assault on our constitutional rights, we have an obligation to remedy it. And I appreciate that language of assault on our constitutional rights. Um, that it is a collective assault that we we experience uh, together. So, so I have three questions that were submitted in advance for you. Um, these are in no particular order. So the first is, um, what if any do you think would be the short-term and long-term effects of integrated cities and towns on the number of Black elected officials? Well, it's... Um... It, it would be a mixed effect. In some places, it would reduce the number of black elected officials because one of the consequences of segregation is that we have uh, segregated uh, public officials. So uh, it might be less likely that we would have black, black, you know, one of the things that we've done in this country every time a, uh, a community becomes um, uh, under-resourced because um, we concentrate the most disadvantaged people in it, then we turn it over to black elected officials and say, you fix it. So that would cease to happen. On the other hand, uh, African-Americans would have representation in a much broader uh, range of communities. Uh, as you know, uh, when, um, when uh, uh, politicians want to reduce the influence of African-Americans in uh, public policy, what they do is they gerrymander districts so they concentrate well, as many African-Americans as possible in single districts so that they can elect a, some African-American representatives but have no influence anywhere else. 
So I think if we redress segregation, um, in some places we'd find fewer black elected officials and in some places we'd find more of them. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question is as follows. Assuming AFFH, so affirmatively furthering fair housing will be reinstated. Do you believe communities will decide to redress the harm caused by redlining or will they need to be forced to do so? In Germany, restitution has justly been paid and continues to be paid to Holocaust survivors. In the US, slaveholders received restitution, not our fellow African-American citizens. And then this question is, is, is phrased from the Jewish perspective, but I think I would expand it to say people of faith. So they, the questioner writes, how can we as Jews and perhaps we can expand that to people of faith or just humans in this country, not join in the effort to provide restitution for the atrocities of slavery. Well, that's a, a many questions there. Let me try to separate them out. Uh, um, it's true, it's likely that the Biden administration will reinstate the affirmatively furthering fair housing rule, which is a rule that the Obama administration um, established and the Trump administration revoked that required communities to assess the extent to which they're segregated and come up with proposals to redress that segregation. Uh, the Obama administration adopted this rule late in its um, tenure. And so it never came to the point where any uh, community uh, proposed a, a ways of, of uh, redressing its segregation and then refused to implement it, which is what the rule required, and then had federal funds withheld from it. No federal funds were held from anywhere. Uh, and I don't think it ever would have happened because as I said earlier, I think we don't have the political support at this point to redress segregation. And you've all heard the term and communities like yours, uh, the, the NIMBYs, the not in my backyard, syndrome is much more powerful than the redress segregation syndrome. And we've got to change that. And the only way we can change that is by creating, I think, local groups of activists, biracial, uh, the biracial and multi-ethnic now, to um, make the case that um, uh, we need to uh, do something about this uh, assault on our, our constitutional system. Uh, we, uh, this, the new movement to redress racial segregation I'm involved in has a curriculum unit, for example, that uh, uh, tells this story accurately, unlike our current uh, high school curricula, which uh, promote the myth of de facto segregation. As, as you know, as part of the book, The Color of Law, I survey existing textbooks that are commonly used in um, uh, American schools, high schools across the country. Every one of these textbooks lies about the history. They talk about the great work that the New Deal did in um, uh, building housing for um, uh, workers who were, uh, couldn't find it, never mentioning it was segregated. They talk about the great work that the government did in creating suburbs, never mentioning that it was for whites only. And they talk about de facto segregation as the way in which it happened. Well, uh, if the next generation doesn't learn this history any better than ours have, uh, uh, they're gonna be in as poor a position to remedy it as we do. So one of the first things that the new movement to redress racial segregation is going to recommend to its local committees is to conduct a campaign to get its local school district to adopt an accurate curriculum. And we have a curriculum unit we can provide, but there are others as well. We have um, a, a short video a design for high school students and by the way, I can, uh, when I send the, the, the information about how to get on the mailing list for the new movement, uh, I can also send links to these curricular units. And uh, we should have campaigns to get the school districts, superintendents, principals to adopt an accurate curriculum and stop lying about this history. Yeah, you know, the, I would just say, as you as you brought up toward the end uh, of your remarks, this this reality of this divided world, divided country that we live in now, and this question of forgotten history or lying about our history, you know, there there is this interesting question of how does one communicate facts 
ac across the lines of this division. Um, and obviously in a situation where you have multiple people of multiple backgrounds or multiple races, I assume that helps to uh, create some kind of bridging um, per perhaps, um, but I'm curious if you have thoughts um, about how, how one communicates or, or pressures an education system to change enough in order to speak to, shall we call it a fuller truth, the full truth um, of, of these impacts. Something, I mean, it, perhaps an, an example might be the construction of our highway system. A la, a la the New Deal, some something like that. I mean, do do how might you respond to that? Well, I, I don't know that I really can respond. The, the tactics that local committees would use would vary from place to place. In some places, they would have influence with individual school board members. In some places, they might uh, have to uh, conduct a public campaign uh, to elect different school board members. In some places, they might. Um, be able to conduct a, a, a public campaign against the, the leaders of a school district. Uh, it will vary from place to place. The, the, this uh, new movement to redress racial segregation is not going to be prescript, prescriptive about the tactics that will be used in any particular community. We'll give support to people who are responsible uh, in, in the tactics that they employ, but they'll vary from place to place. So you'll have to assess um, the, the, the situation in your own uh, school districts about what the best way. In some places, there are this curriculum unit that we've um, uh, developed and has been being used by seventy thousand teachers now across the country, but they're individual teachers. They're not. It's not part of the. And that will be uh, the way it will start in some places as well. Thank you. I'm trying to sort of lump together um, a number of of questions that are popping up that I see in the chat. Um, one one that has come, been brought forward is uh, can you speak to voluntary busing programs this this questioner brings it up specifically in reference to LA uh, and noting that they seem to have disappeared um, can you speak to those sorts of programs their impact well um... you know th there are many small things we can do around the edges to try to um make uh, small changes, which are important to do. That's the way we start. I will say that most um, African-American children, most white children in this country live too far from neighborhoods, other race neighborhoods to uh, accomplish uh, significant school desegregation uh, without neighborhood desegregation. We can do voluntary busing. There are supple there's a model program in the Boston metropolitan area. There's another model program in the Hartford metropolitan area of voluntary busing. Um, typically it's suburban in, in Massachusetts. I know uh, the state um, will subsidize uh, school districts, suburban school districts that will accept uh, voluntary um, bus students from urban areas. Uh, so these are models. There are other things we can do in, a, in places where there are adjoining, where there are borderline uh, uh, borders between black, predominantly black and predominantly white neighborhoods. You can merge school districts. You can adjust attendance zones to try to create some um, minimal uh, desegregation. In some places you can create magnet schools. If you have a broad district, that includes both black and white students in different parts. You can create magnet schools that attract students of different races to the same school. But all of these tactics are fairly minimal so long as we have segregated neighborhoods. And uh, it's the neighborhood segregation that's the underlying cause of our school segregation problems. Thank you. I think we probably have time for two more questions. I want to ask this one just because it was the very first one in our Q&A uh, chat, which was, can you talk about the impact of the, I believe it's pronounced Gatro decision and whether today it has continued to have impact on desegregation? I don't know the correct pronunciation, so forgive me if well, I destroyed it's it. It's typically called Gatro. Um, Gatro, good. <laughs> uh, you know, um, <laughs> funny you should ask that. As you can see, I'm an old man. When I was a young man living in Chicago in the 1960s, I was... Um, an assistant, uh, a research assistant at the Chicago Urban League. 
that was, uh, and my job was to, um, the Gautreaux decision, let me just uh, skip ahead for a minute. The Gautreaux decision was a uh, Supreme Court decision that um, uh, confirmed that the, the city of Chicago had placed public housing for black uh, families in black neighborhoods and public housing for white families in white neighborhoods. And it was unconstitutional. It, uh, there was a, a settlement that uh, required um, the uh, uh, city to maintain a different policy in response to the, the Nixon administration at the time uh, abolished public housing so that there was no opportunity to place uh, more public housing and um, uh, in desegregated fashion, but instead they embarked on a program where Section 8 vouchers, I don't know if you're familiar with those, but these are subsidies that are given to low-income families where uh, vouchers were enhanced to permit uh, some uh, African-American public housing residents uh, to uh, relocate to higher opportunity communities. And it was a very successful program. I think it still exists today. Uh, I was a, a young man. I, I spent um, a hot summer in the um, basement of the Robert Taylor homes where the Chicago Housing Authority records were kept, going through correspondence back to the 1930s to demonstrate that the policy of segregation was an intentional one. So I, I am familiar with the Gautreaux decision. Thank you for that. I, I don't know if the questioner sort of knew that or, you know, but it worked out, it worked out well. Um, so, oh gosh, there are so many questions in the Q&A and um, they, they really range. And so for, for those whose questions haven't been answered, many of these for what it's worth, uh, Richard does answer in his book chapters dedicated them dedicated to them. So so uh, please, if you have not read his book, really do. Um, and many other recommendations for other wonderful books have been posted up in the chat. Um, I, I'll leave you with with one that's more about your personal feeling uh, than anything about your knowledge necessarily, Richard. But this this question asks: uh, Are you optimistic that we can put together the political will? to make the changes that are needed? I'm very hopeful, very optimistic, not confident, but I'm hopeful and optimistic. We are now having in this country today, a more accurate and passionate discussion about the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow than we ever have had before in American history. We had um, some 20 million Americans participated in Black Lives Matter demonstrations. Uh, last summer and spring, unprecedented. And uh, most of those uh, participants, unlike previous civil rights demonstrations, most of them were white. They, they, they were uh, demonstrations, perhaps I don't know if there were any in your community, but um, some of these demonstrations were in places uh, where, where there were no African-Americans living. But people were um, enraged when they realized uh, uh, the extent to which uh, there was discriminatory police abuse and murder in some cases of African Americans in this country. So I'm very hopeful. Uh, but out of this passionate and, and accurate discussion for the first time that we're having, it has to go beyond discussion. And that's why uh, I'm uh, so convinced that we need a new civil rights movement that's going to take this awareness uh, into uh, action to uh, fix this problem. So long as, I'll, I'll, I'll conclude this again, uh, saying this as, as said before, so long as we thought it happened by accident, that's a paralyzing view. The de facto segregation notion is a paralyzing view because we think it happened by accident, it can only unhappen by accident. Once we understand it was the creation of explicit policy, it's easy to believe and to understand that policy can reverse it, policy can fix it. And because we are growing in that understanding, it's not just because of my book. As, as you know, there are many, many books now that are widely popular about race and the history of uh, slavery and of, of Jim Crow. Uh, as we develop this greater understanding, I think the motivation to fix it will grow as well. So I am hopeful. Well, and that's always a good note to end on. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll take hope any day, uh, certainly, uh, and and absolutely on this on the conclusion of this MLK Day, we take hope uh, and choose that every day. So, for um, on behalf of all of the faith communities and everyone else who is here uh, and who has been with us.
we say thank you to you, Richard, for sharing your evening with us and your knowledge with us. And I, I think I can speak for everyone uh, when I say you have challenged us. And uh, I know that many of the communities who are here are interested now in moving forward, if not having already begun this work, uh, will continue to do so. Uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you to all of the Glencoe Clergy Association, Houses of Worship, the larger North Shore suburban community of worship and faith, and the larger Chicagoland and national communities. Everyone who's been here with us uh, this night, we thank you and look forward to continuing the work together. Thank you so much. Thank you.